Okay, uh, so Rhyme Tovim, everybody, Erev Tov in Israel, although it's not quite Erev, it's just getting to be Erev Tov now that we're, we're catching up time-wise. And uh, okay, we're part eight of our 10-part series. There'll be two more weeks after today. Um, next week will also be 6 p.m. Israeli time. And then in two, uh, 7 p.m. Israeli time. And then in two weeks, we'll be back to 8 p.m. Israeli time. But for those in North America, We'll keep our time at 1 p.m. Just a quick reminder, of course, the she room tomorrow, tomorrow night, Dr. Sokolow, and Thursday morning, um, um, Shuli Mishkin's class will not take place because of Purim. Uh, we cancel Torah reading to hear the Megillah, but Thursday night we will be having a Parshat Ashir, uh, Parshat Ashir, that's already Motzei Purim, 8.30 p.m. That will be given by yours truly. So everybody's welcome at 8.30, and then the, of course, the reg, my regular Shir on the Sitter, 9 a.m. on Friday morning, and then Rabbi Liebtag will be back He's God's Sunday at 11.15. So we leave it in Rabbi Israel's wonderful hands and everybody be well. And uh, I'm going back to teach. I'm sorry. But I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm sorry, but that's the way it works. And uh, enjoy. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, fabulous. Great to see you all here. Um, lovely to see your happy, smiling faces. And uh, we are back with Eliyahu Hanavi. Um, and I have to say, there's a few lines that we have missed out in Sefer Malachim, uh, because whereas all the Eliyahu and Abi stories take place in the northern kingdom, in Yisrael, um, there is a little interlude of the in, in Sefer Malachim at the end of uh, Malachim Aleph, Perak Chafbet, which deals with Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat's one of the uh, righteous kings in the south. We're going to skip that because it's not relevant to the Elio stories. And we're going to move to uh, the story of King Ahaziah. Ahab is dead. He died in war against the Arameans. And now we're going to meet the first of Ahab's sons, Ahab's son Ahaziah. And um, we're going to see the, the interaction between Ahaziah and uh, Eliyahu. Actually, just one second, just one second, I'll be back. Sorry about that, just needed to get my Tanakh off the shelf. Um, it's always useful to have a Tanakh when you give it a Tanakh shear. Uh, would be would be a, a no-brainer here. Um, so let's, uh, let's get to um, the Let's get to the chapter. It's a very, today we have a very exciting chapter for you. And let me just tell you what's coming the next two weeks, please, God. Um, next week, uh, we will be finishing, we will be reading chapter two, which will be the story of Eliyahu, uh, so to speak, dying. Did he die? Did he not die? Eliyahu traveling heavenwards in a whirlwind. And then we will spend our final week talking about the legends of Eliyahu, um, did Eliyahu die? Did he not? Does and it'll be great because it'll be our last class before Pesach. So we'll start talking about why Eliyahu is said to visit our Seder table, and it will give us a great opportunity to talk about how Eliyahu manifests himself after after he goes heavenwards. So this is perfect. This week, chapter one. Next week, chapter two, and then we'll be talking about Eliyahu in the context of uh, of Pesach and all of that. So let's take a, a, a look at this chapter and maybe I'll introduce it with a question before I even share my screen. What should a prophet do when the king of Israel finds himself in peril and he turns to an idolatrous God instead of to Hashem? How might God act? How should the Navi act, right? And this chapter, will describe a very violent confrontation between Eliyahu and the emissaries, the delegates of the king of Israel, when the king of Israel finds himself um, um, in, in, in a situation of sickness. So let's get straight to the text and share screen here. Here we go. Okay, who is up? and who is down, and you will soon see why this is the appropriate title for this chapter. Um, I am 
going to start, we, we want to introduce the character known as Achazia. So let's do that. We're going to start from verse 51 in chapter, in chapter where you see the red highlighting, right? Where you see the red, where it says Achazia, son of Achav. I hope you can see that on the sheet. Achazia, son of Achav. That's what we're looking at. And here we go. Uh, Achazia. Son of Achav became king in Israel. Achazia ben Achav, Malach al Israel, Bishamron, Bishnat Shvai Israel, or Shafat Melech Yudah, Vahimloch al Israel, Shnatayim. It says that he reigned over Israel for two years. Now, I do have to say, it doesn't really mean two years. And the reason why I say that is because we're going to see that his brother is going to, re going to come to the throne in the 18th year of Yehoshaphat, which means he really only ruled a year or even less than a year. And we'll see why in a second. Let's just take a look at who is this Ahaziah. It says he reigned for two years, but probably they already count his second year from his first year, if that makes any sense, right? He gets crowned, it's already a year, and already from the first year they count it as his second year. What do we want to know? He, first of all, he's the son of Ahav, right? And that should mean something to us after we've studied with all of this. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he went in the path of his father and the path of his mother. So they mentioned three people, his father, Ahav, his mother, Jezebel, and Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, Yeravam, who, who repudiated Yerushalayim and decided to set up alternative shrines, alternative temples, in Beit El and done in the north. He served and worshipped Baal. Okay, so that's pretty bad. And aroused the anger of the Lord, God of Israel, just as his father had done. So far, as far as we know, Ahaziah is an idolater, and that's all we know about him. But we're going to see another couple of things. After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. Okay, so what does this show us? That Ahab was very strong, but Ahaziah loses power it seems like various colonies however we want to call it decide to have their own independence and maybe this shows that Ahav really had great power as a, a warlord and held a military deterrence but Ahaziah didn't um, I have to say we're not going to get to it in in chapter three in chapter three we're going to see more of this story about Moab but this is actually one of the earliest events in the Tanakh, which we have direct evidence about. There is a huge a basalt rock, which was found in the Transjordan, in the Jordan side of the Jordan. Um, and it is called the Mesha steel, a steely Mesha. St I think if I'm not mistaken, it is sitting in the Louvre. Um, I'll type its name in, in case I didn't pronounce it properly. Um, and it is a, it tells the story of Moab's rebellion against Israel from the Moabite side. And it actually mentions the name of Ahav. It mentions the name of Hashem by his name, Yudke Vavke, and talks about how Moab rebelled. This rebellion, this verse one in chapter in Malachim Bet, by Yisha Moab Israel, we have absolute evidence of that. In fact, we have the whole written text by King Mesha and how they staged this rebellion and what it what it meant in chapter three of Malachim bet we're going to see that Israel go back to attack Moab and uh, establish uh, try and re-establish sovereignty doesn't quite work but that's that's the story uh, but it is amazing that we actually have material evidence um, of a huge text from this period um, really remarkable back to Ahaziah now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room. Apparently he had a second floor of his house or he had some upper chamber and he had a sort of ma'ke, some sort of uh, uh, um, banister and the banister was some sort of lattice. He, he leaned on it and he thought it and it gave way and he fell down and injured himself. Okay, so... Very soon, Ahaziah has a pretty bad domestic accident, falls down the stairs, and 
in, we're going to see pretty much that's his end. That's why he doesn't last very long, because he has a very nasty accident. What else can we say about Achaziah, just for the sake of the, the whole story? Let, that's why I brought actually what's at the top of your sheet. If you look at the top of your sheet, you'll see a few other interesting details here. Just take a look right at the top, 1 Kings chapter 22. It says, Yoshafat built a fleet of trading ships to go to Ophir for gold, but they never set sail. They were wrecked at Etzion Gaver. Okay. Yoshafat apparently had built some what are called Oniot Tarshish ships, which were strong enough to go all the way to Tarshish. Remember Tarshish with Yonah? And he wanted to go to Africa, to Ophira, to get Zahav. We think that Ophir is Africa. But apparently there was a storm at Etzion Gaver. Where's Etzion Gaver? Etzion Gaver is actually Eilat. There was a storm at Eilat. And at that time, Achaziah, son of Achav, said to Yoshafat, let my men sail with yours, but Yoshafat refused. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it seems like, and again, in Divrei Yamim, it actually says it the opposite way around, that the reason why the ships, why there was a storm and the mission became ruined was because, once again, Yoshafat is associating with the north and Hashem disapproved and therefore Hashem scuttled this particular uh, naval mission and Yehoshaphat could not collaborate with Achaziah. Why am I even mentioning this? Just so that we should gain a sense, right? There is a sense that Achaziah wanted to affiliate himself with Yehoshaphat. That failed. At this point, Achaziah loses the colony of Moab and last of all, uh, oh, he's also a huge idolater like his parents. And last of all, he falls down the stairs. So Achaziah, in our, in, in our uh, perspective, is not having a lot of luck. He's not a particularly successful individual. And I think that's the way that we're going to remember him, right? Really one of the failed kings of the north. Achaziah does not have a very, very good track record. And it's at this point that we see the whole story um, start opening up. Let's take a look. Achaziah is sick and he sent messages saying to them, go and consult with Baal Zavuv, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. And here we see a, an amazing story where a king of Israel decides to send to Baal Zavuv, the god of Ekron, to find out im echye mecholi ze. Now, let me just say that this is a pattern in Sefer Malachim. Sefer Malachim has four kings who suffer from illness or experience illness and go visit the prophet. Okay. In Malachim Aleph, Parat Yudalad, we find that Yeravam's son is sick and he sends his wife to go to the prophet Achia Shiloni to find out whether his son will survive. This is the second story. The third story is about a foreign king, Ben Hadad, who goes to Elisha and asks him, will I live from this sickness? And the last one is King Chizkiyahu, who encounters the prophet to find out whether he will survive his sickness. Right? Obviously, in a time where there were not ex exceedingly sophisticated medical, um, you know, doctors could either be good or bad, Right, it would certainly seem to be as sensible to go and appeal to the prophet as to the doctor. The doctor didn't have a lot of medical knowledge, but could help you to a degree, and the prophet could help you with your spiritual side. Right, and therefore we find that frequently kings, when they're in trouble, seek out the prophet. Okay, but here he is not seeking out a Jewish prophet. He is going to Ekron. Ekron is one of the five Philistine cities. We know that the Philistines had five cities. Number one, Gaza. Number two, Ashkelon. Number three, Ashdod. Number four, Gat. Number five, Ekron. Five cities of the Philistines. And he is sending to the Philistines, and apparently their god is called Baal Zavuv. It's a funny name, no? Baal Zavuv. If you translate it literally in Hebrew, it is the Lord of the Flies. Okay, now that doesn't sound so, certainly if you know the book, it doesn't sound so good. And I have to say that if you know your New Testament, which I do not, but for this purpose, I know this little bit, right? You've all heard, probably heard of Belzebub, right? Belzebub is Balzavuv, right? 
And Baal Zavuv, Belzebub is the is the head of the, the demons, right? Now that's not from the Bible, our Bible, that's from the Christian Bible, from the New Testament. So what exactly is Baal Zavuv? Now we know about the Baal, right? We've all heard about the Baal, the Baal and the Asherah. And it seems like there were different types of Baal. For example, in the Torah, we hear about something called Baal Safon, the Baal of the North, Baal Safon. The academics tell us that there is no such God called Baal Zavuv, but there is a God called Baal Zavul, with Zayin Bet Vav Lamad. What does the word Zavul mean? The word Zavul means majesty. In fact, the temple is called by Solomon Beit Zavul, the house of majesty, Beit Zavul. And it seems like he was sending to a type of Baal of the Philistines called Baal Zavul, the Baal of majesty. In which case, you're going to ask the question, why do they call it the Lord of the Flies, right, instead of the Lord of majesty, right? By the way, what I'm presenting here is not my own thoughts. It is the work of Professor Kasuto. If you look up Baal Zavul in the biblical encyclopedia, you'll find the entry of Professor Kasuto, and that's what I'm referring to, just to give you my sources. So, um, and he says the following, and it's really interesting. He says that sometimes the Tanakh takes a name of Avodazara and twists it or makes fun of it. An interesting question, an interesting example is maybe you've heard about um, uh, maybe you've heard about Shaul's son, whose name was Ish Boshet. Ish Boshet, right? Or Murphy Boshet, man of shame. So when you look in Divrei Yamin, they tell you his name was actually Ishbaal. Ishbaal. Now I'm not even going to go into why um, Shaul would use the word Baal in his son's name, but let's just say his name was Ishbaal, fire of Baal. And the Bible didn't like the name Baal to be associated with Shaul. So what do they call him? Ishboshet, man of shame. Instead of the word Baal, they put shame, Baal, ba Boshet. You get my point? In which case, instead of calling this god Baal Zavuv, they, it's Baal Zavul, how, the Baal of majesty, what do they call it? Baal Zavuv. They make fun of it. The only reason why I'm going into this long, long-winded thing <laughs> is because I want to say something about a different person whose name is probably related to the word Zavul, and that is Izebel. Many of you have heard the name Izebel, and you might be wondering about it. Jezebel. Izebel sounds like Zebel, which means garbage, trash, rubbish, okay? Or maybe even worse than that, manure, Zebel, okay? And so why would a queen of, uh, be called Zebel, right? And the answer is, right, that sometimes the Bible plays around with names, and most people think that her name was actually Remember, what did we just say? Baal Zavul. Her name was, in fact, Bat Zavul, daughter of majesty. Bat Zavul. But what does the Bible do with her name? Because she's such a horrible woman. Calls her Ezebel, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, and plays around with her name to make her name. And in fact, there's a clue with that because when they condemn her, they say she, she will become like manure on the field. Why would you refer to her name as manure? Because they called her Izebel, right? I'll give you one further example of this. You might remember the stories of King David in the book of Shmuel, Shmuel Aleph Perak Chafhei, and you meet a man called Naval. Naval means an awful person, a low life, and everybody wonders, who would be called their son Naval, right? Naval means a scoundrel, an evil person, a bad man. Why? In fact, even his own wife says, Kishmo Kenhu, like his name, so he is. Naval HaKarmeli, right? Shmuel Aleph Perak Chafhei. Is, would you ever call somebody Naval? The answer is, of course you wouldn't. In fact, his name was probably, do you remember there was a, I, I don't know if he's still alive, but there was a Palestinian negotiator called Nabil Shaat. Do you remember him? Nabil Shaat? Right? Nabil. 
Nabil is an Arab name. And you know what Nabil means? It means a nobleman, right? Like in English, Nabil, noble, right? But the Bible plays around with names sometimes. So Nabil becomes, when he's a horrible man, what do you call him? Naval, right? You call him differently. You call him a Naval, a lowlife. So we have Nabil becomes Naval. We have Beit Zavul becomes Beit Zavuv. And Izevel, and, uh, sorry, and Batzavul becomes Izevel. And here you see the Bible ridiculing both evil people and foreign deities, Elohim Achirim, right? Um, acting in the way to, uh, and uh, by the way, sometimes you will even hear people do it even in our own day. So for example, there is a passage which says, Shame Elohim Achirim Lo Yaskur Al Picha. You shouldn't mention the name of other gods. And therefore, sometimes you will find people who will not pronounce the name of Jesus, right? Or won't pronounce the name, and they will somehow twist his name and call, say, Yoshka or something like that, because they don't want to mention other names. And where do you have such a, a tradition coming from? It comes from this. It comes from the Pasuk in Devarim, the Shem Elohim Acharim Lotas Kirot Picha, don't mention other gods, but it also comes from this tradition, which you find even within the Bible itself to play around with idolatrous names and adjust them and, you know, turn them into a more disparaging or derogatory name. So um, that's just at the sidelines of this, but it, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's something. Okay, let's go back to our story because we've got a lot to do and not enough time. So let's take a look and let's go back to the text and start reading the story. What do we know? Ahaziah has sent a delegation and he sent messengers and says to them, go consult Balzavuv. Um, Will I live from this sickness? But the angel of God said to Eliyahu Atishbi, right, and now pay attention to the language, Kum, arise, Likrat Malachi Melech Shomron, go to the messengers, the delegates of the king of Samaria, and say to them, What are there no gods in Israel? You have to go to a foreign deity, Elohei Akron, Lechain, Ko Amar Hashem, so says Hashem, Hamita Ashe Alitasham, Lo Tered Mimena. The bed that you ascended, you will not descend from. Kimot tamut vayelech Eliyah. Eliyah went. Okay, so what do we see? And I want to maybe say something about this chapter in general. This chapter is going to be a sort of almost game of delegates. Everything is going to be about malachim, about messengers or delegates. We're going to see that Achaziah is sending a delegation and God sends Eliyahu to thwart them. And the question is always going to be who's going to have control over the delegates? Who's going to have control over the middlemen? That's the first thing I want to say about this chapter. Second one is that you will see in this chapter a very, very vertical chapter. It begins with Vayapel Paul Achaziah. Achaziah fell. Fell. Pay attention to that word, right? He fell down in verse two. And then what does God say to Eliyahu? Kum, arise. And the key text is going to be verse four. The bed which you ascended, um, you will not descend from, right? The English here is absolutely awful, I have to say. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. It certainly ignores all the vertical aspects, but we can read the Hebrew, the bed you ascended, you will not descend from it. Okay? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read through the whole chapter very quickly. It's not a long chapter. And then I'll start analyzing it. I think that will make things easier for us. So I'm going to read from uh, verse 4. I'm going to read very quickly the story to make sure we're all up to speed, and then we'll say some things about the story. So, so Eliyahu is told to say two things. Number one, is there no God in Israel that you're going to consult with Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekron, or you're going to seek? And therefore, the bed you're ascended on, 
you will not descend from, Mot Tamut, you will certainly die. And Eliyahu went. And the messengers returned to the king and he said to them, Shavtem, why have you come back so quickly? Right? Or why have you returned? And they said, by Yom Elav, they said to the king, Ish Alali Kratenu, a man came. Right? Again, notice the vertical. A man ascended to meet us. By Yom Elenu, and he said, Lechu Shuvu, go back, pay attention to the word Shuvu. Return, El Amelech Hashem Shalach Etchem B'Divartem Elav, and say to him, Ho Amar Hashem, so says God, are there no gods in Israel that you're going to seek, the God of uh, Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekron, and therefore the bed that you have ascended, you will not descend from, indeed, you will certainly die. And he said to them, the king asked the delegation, what is the nature, or what kind of man came to meet you, who told you this? And they said, um, Ish Balsear, a very hairy man, or maybe a person with a garment of hair, the Azor or Azur Bamotnav, and that he has a leather belt. And he said, the king said, Ooh, Eliyahu Atishbihu, that must be Eliyahu. Apparently, Eliyahu was identifiable just from his outward appearance. And next. So the king sends to Eliyahu a captain of 50 with his 50 men. Vayal Elav, again, please notice the vertical language. And Vayal Elav, he went up to him, right? Bine Yashab al Roshahar, he is sitting, Eliyahu was sitting on the top of the mountain. Vayidaber Elav, Ish Elohim, Hamelech Diber Reda. And he yelled at him and said, or he spoke to him and he said, Man of God, the king says, Descend, come down. Bayom Eliyahu. And Eliyahu said, El Sarah Hamishim to the captain of the 50, Im Ish Elohimani, if I am a man of God, Tayraid, Eishman Hashamayim, let fire descend from heaven, Bato Chalot Chavit Hamishecha, and will consume you and your 50 men. But Tayraid, Eishman Hashamayim, and fire comes down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. And he sent another set, another uh, captain of 50, the Chamishav and his 50 men. So, oh man of God, quickly descend, Raida. Let fire come down from heaven. And the fire of God came down from heaven. He sent a third captain of 50, and his 50 men. And the man ascended. By the way, notice that verb. He ascended. And the third captain of the 50 kneeled down on his knees in front of Eliyahu, and he pleaded with him, and he spoke to him and said, Oh man of God, please have respect for my life. Let my life be cherished before you and the life of my servants, these 50 men. Behold, fire has come down from the heavens and has consumed the two sets of the two captains of the 50 and their men. And now, please cherish my life, have respect for my life in your eyes. The angel of God said to Eliyahu, go with him, again, descend with him, do not fear him. He got up, again, two interesting words, with him to the king. He came to the king and said, because you sent messengers to Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekron, because there is no God in Israel for you to consult. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult? You sent messages to consult Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekron, and because you've done this, the bed that you have ascended Right, you will not descend from Kimot Tamut. Indeed, you will die by Yamat Kidvar Hashem. And as God spoke, he died. Interestingly enough, Kidvar Hashem Asher Diber Eliyah. 
like the word of God which Eliyahu spoke, so he died. And Yehoram, his brother, ruled after him. Okay, that's it. End of the story. <laughs> what you see in this story, did you notice, I, I don't know how you couldn't have, a lot of repetition, okay? A lot of repetition. In fact, if we just take a look down to page three, you will see the structure of the story, which I think is very um, clear, right? Where on the one hand, we have three, uh, we have an introductory exposition, the king gets sick, the conclusion is the king dies. And in between, we have, if you want three, two stories nested one within the other, each one a threefold story. Okay. I think we mentioned in a previous class that the stories of Eliyahu are frequently threefold, right? A lot of the stories are in patterns of three, uh, three years of, of, of a drought. Um, all sorts of threes that we will find uh, in the story of uh, Eliyahu, three wars of Achav with Ben-Hadad, if you recall. And now, of course, we're going to hear the prophecy once spoken by the angel to Eliyahu in verse four, the properly a second time spoken by the messengers of Ahaziah and reported back to him. And the first time the prophecy actually spoken by Eliyahu himself in verse 16. Likewise, we find three times groups of 50 soldiers. The first time they're consumed. The second time they're consumed. The third time they appeal to Eliyahu in a meek and uh, respectful way. And then Eliyahu goes with them to Shomron to deliver the message in person. Um, so what's going on here with these triplicates? What seems to be happening here? And what is the, seems to be the point of this very lengthy story? In fact, I have to say that you could have told the story like this, right? You know, the king sent messages to Ekron, um, Eliyahu sent them back, and Eliyahu came to the king and said, you know, you're going to die because you sent these messengers. And we wouldn't have missed too much. But of course, the story is telling us about far more than that. And what you will notice clearly is the use over and over of um, emissaries, delegates, uh, somebody who is a medium, somebody who is, who, is a, who is sent. The notion, of course, is who has the power to send messengers and why, what are they, and why are they being sent and for what? And that's where we're we're going to put our focus as we look at this chapter. So let's go back sort of to the beginning and ask ourselves, what is upsetting Hashem? What is upsetting Eliyahu, etc.? And I would argue uh, the following. Well, number one, let's, well, let, let's start with a few questions. Number one, why is God so worried about Ahaziahu sending messengers to Ekron? And one would have to say that there is an aspect here of a phenomenal Chilul Hashem. Um, the notion of Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem is writ large in many, many places in Tanakh. Um, you will, of course, remember where, um, when Moshe is arguing after the Egal Azahav, after the Golden Calf, one of the arguments that he uses to defend the Jewish people is what will the Egyptians say? What will the world say when they see um, a God kill his people? They will say, The God is a powerful God, but he is an evil God. And therefore, God, you can't destroy your people. And indeed, this is one of the arguments that allows God to um, withhold the punishment for the Egel Hazahav. In many places in Tanakh, we find this in Shira, in, in the story of the Meraglim, in Shirat Ta'azinu, and very strongly in the book of Ezekiel, frequently God will say, Va'as l'man gadol. The, I, the Jewish people didn't deserve it, but I acted, says God, so as not to desecrate my own name. 
In other words, I, well, you know, let me put this in maybe in the most positive sense that I can imagine. The opposite of, of Hilul Hashem is Kiddush Hashem. And in the vision of Mashiach that we see, for example, in chapter two of the book of Isaiah, we have this idea that in Bahayab Amim, it will be in the end of days, nations will come to Yerushalayim and to seek God, right? And he, they will come and seek God to adjudicate their arguments. They won't go to war. They'll take their swords and turn them into pruning hooks, etc., etc. Why? Because they'll come to Jerusalem to consult with God, for God to adjudicate their international disputes. In other words, people won't, nations won't need to go to war. They will trust God's, what's the next line? They will rely on the word of God. In other words, when we value justice in Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be the place that people will come to seek advice. And the greatest inverse of that is for Jews to go to other peoples that instead of consulting with their own God, they go and consult with others and it wouldn't be so bad if this was just words of wisdom, but they're going to consult with a foreign deity, an idolatrous deity. And therefore, it would appear that not only does Hashem want to condemn Ahaziah for this, but he wants to go one stage further. He is actually going to stop the messengers. He is actually going to thwart the delegates. He's going to make sure that this delegation never crosses the border that they don't even reach Ekron, they don't make it to the Philistines and engage in that great Chilul Hashem, which is that God is so impotent that he is incapable of giving advice to his own kings. And therefore Eliyahu is sent as an emissary in order to forestall the king's emissaries. <laughs> it's like the king has sent a delegation and in order to confront them, God sends his own delegate, in other words, Eliyahu. And here, the fascinating thing happens. Um, first of all, the statement made time after time is a double-barreled one. Number one, point number one. Is there no God in Israel that you sent to Balzavuv? So that's the first line, right? Is they Hamibli en Elohim be Israel Asher Atem Sholchim the Balzavuv? So that's the first thing. How dare you do something like that? Right? Um, where am I looking here? The first time we see it is in verse three. Hamibli en Elohim be Israel Atem Olchim the Drosh be Balzavuv Elohei Akron. The English, by the way, here says you're going to consult, but the word lidrosh is much more than that. The word lidrosh is not just to consult, but it's to beseech. It is to implore. It is to, you know, to pray. He doesn't just want information. He wants to go to the God with a help, hope that the God will even intercede or, 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 or look out for him. But the second point is, therefore, the bed that you ascended, you will not descend. In fact, you're going to die. In other words, maybe you would not have died. But now that you've sent this delegation to an idolatrous deity, now you certainly will, not tamut, you will die. I'll take questions in just one minute, but let me just move one stage further. The incredible thing that happens here is, of course, that Eliyahu meets the delegation in verse 3 and 4. And then look at verse 5. Okay, The messengers return to the king. And he said, why have you come back? And they say, a man came to meet us and said, go back to the king who sent you. Notice the phrase there once again, right? Go back to the king. Asher shalach etchem. There's a very strong verb of uh, the notion of malachim, angels or delegates, right? Um, if you look here, malachim melech shomon in verse three, hamalachim in verse five, and say to him, um, do you understand what we're hearing here? Let me maybe try to take a step back. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you know Masechet Gitin, but in Masechet Gitin, which deals with a get, which deals with, uh, there is whole chapters which deal with agency. They deal with what happens if you send a, a divorce document by means of a agent, a, a, of a court uh, delegate. And uh, we have this notion of shlucho shel adam kemoto, that when you, uh, when, if I send an agent in order to divorce somebody, then that person is like an extension of me. By the way, if I, their way, pull out my authority before that agent has reached there, then it's as if I have deactivated the document. But whenever you have a shaliach, right, whenever you have an agent, the agent is like the long arm of me. I want you to see the way they talk here, right? Look at verse six. Achaziyahu's own delegates should be empowered by Achaziyah. They should be in, they should be fueled and propelled by the power of the king. But look the way they're talking. They say, right? So this is what the Lord says. Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're sending messages to consult Baal Zavuv? Therefore, you will not lead the bed you're, you're lying on that. Of course, they're reporting what they heard from Eliyahu. But they say, how does, how does Achaziah hear it? Ko amar Hashem. In other words, what have we done? We've turned Achaziah's messengers 180 degrees. I haven't only reversed them directionally, but they are now powered. They're now activated not by Ahaziah, the king of Israel, but instead by Eliyahu, the Ish Elohim, Eliyahu, the prophet of God. And pay attention to that almost like that nested. In other words, the, they are now the emissaries of Eliyahu, who himself is the emissary of God. They're drawing their energy. They're drawing their, if you want, their moral agency from Hashem instead of from Ahaziah. And that is exactly what Hashem wants. Hashem wants them to be his mouthpiece. And maybe I'll pause after saying this and just imagine if they had come back talking full-throatedly in the name of Baal Zavuv, how upsetting that would be, that the king of Israel has to hear, Ko Amar Baal Zavuv. And suddenly now they would be the long arm, they would be empowered they would be mandated by an idolatrous deity that indeed would be a Chil Hashem. So there's this sense of reversal, but also a sense of re-empowerment, a sense of almost, how should I say it? Eliyahu has just kidnapped, so to speak. He has kidnapped and reactivated, reprogrammed um, the, the, the emissaries of the king to instead become the emissaries of God. I think that's quite a powerful reversal. Sandra, you wanted to ask something or comment. Um, yes, um, one small comment, please, on the, on the Lidrosh, um, how powerful it is um, when, um, uh, when uh, um, Rachel goes Lidrosh at Hashem. So you're not just dealing with um, a small inquiry. Um, in her anxiety and desperation, she goes to entreat um, to plead with um, uh, Hashem, and um, and so the, the, the I'm I'm bolstering your your comment about um, uh, the drisha is is much more powerful than the single word would um, in, would imply. And then I also have something um, is did you choose this deliberately for today uh, almost erev Purim because we're dealing with um, the Megillah is on all our minds and we're dealing with a book of Sefer of messengers, of agency, of power, of switching around the power 180 degrees. So I'm watching your face and I'm thinking, if I say this, is it blind? Is it, is it, am I going to belabor the obvious? Is, is Rabbi Israel going to laugh at me? But I didn't want to let it go unsaid. I was thinking to myself, I'm positive you did this on purpose. I'm not that, um, I, I said that our last year will be, uh, will be infused with a bit of Pesach. But to be honest, I actually hadn't uh, planned this uh, but Well, I that's totally why you keep that. us around. That's why you keep us around. You have sensitized us to such a degree that we're seeing it. So there you go. 
Okay, great. So this is but this but isn't is really it wonderful. isn't it something else? One hundred and eighty right, degrees, a turnabout, safarim, 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 malachim, malachim, and who has the power to delegate and and turn them around? Right. It's very nice. Okay, good. Uh, so maybe you know, re, I was just actually listening to some shiurim this afternoon about why God is absent from the Megillah, right? And maybe we do have a, more of a sense now that people can be just uh, this worldly emissaries, but can be, so to speak, in the emissaries in the name in the name of God. So if if we just carry on in this in this vein, um, then of course we maybe understand the central um, the central section as well. Uh, of course, what's happening here is that uh, Eliyahu is trying to come with the force of God, um, but ultimately it's Eliyahu who, who's the real Ish Elohim, and Eliyahu has to deliver the message himself. Um, the problem with Eliyahu is apparently uh, Eliyahu cannot enter Shomron. Let's remember, Izevel is still alive and well and powerful and biting. And therefore it seemed like Eliyahu still has an inability, a legal um, ban on him entering the capital city. And the only way that Eliyahu can get his message to the king is by virtue of emissaries. And this brings us to already the middle section where we see these Sar HaChamishim, right? We see these uh, groups of 50 soldiers who all, and by the way, Let's remind ourselves that oh, we'll certainly see it in the next chapter that frequently the prophets of God are in groups of 50. Do you remember in chapter 18 of Malachim Aleph, we, we had Ovadia and Ovadia hid 100 prophets, 50 in one cave and 50 in the other cave. Right. And in our next chapter, we're also going to see cohorts of 50 prophets. So once again, we have the good guys versus the bad guys. Um, the 50 groups of 50 soldiers who are coming to take down Eliyahu and the 50 groups of 50 prophets who back Eliyahu. Whichever way, what is going on with these groups of 50 soldiers, right, who are coming to, um, they say to Eliyahu, come down the mountain. And of course, this is so Eliyahu. Eliyahu always was on mountains, Mount Carmel, Mount Sinai. Now he's on a unnamed mountain. <laughs> and Eliyahu, of course, is also always bringing fire down from heaven. He brings fire down from heaven at Mount Carmel. He brings fire down from heaven here, right? We remember the fire. God was not in the fire on Mount Sinai. And of course, um, Eliyahu will go up to heaven in a chariot. Um, and Eliyahu... Um, is going to go up to heaven in a chariot of fire. So there is something very, very powerful, very typical about the Eliyahu stories here, but also something very powerful. And, 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 and in this regard, um, let's just track what happens with these groups of 50 soldiers. What, what are they trying to do? OK, if you look at verse nine, Eliel sent it, they sent to Eliel a captain with his company of 50 men and they say, man of God, the king says, come down. And he says, if I'm a man of God, then fire will come down and consume you. The second time, what does he say? Come down at once in Hebrew. Right. Mahera Reda, come down quickly, come down at once. And Eliel once again says the typical line, if I'm the man of God, let fire come down. And this time, by the way, it says, um, sorry, one second. Um, whereas in the first time it said, this says it says, So if you want, the, in the second iteration, the man speaks with greater strength, right? And not only that, um, but the, this time it's not just fire that come down, but God fire, right? God fire that comes down. The third one, of course, has a very different perspective. He um, subdues himself before Eliyahu. He actually doesn't stand at the bottom of the mountain and instruct him to go. What does he do? Number one, he goes up, right? Number two, he goes and 
and kneels on his knees and Vait Khanelat and pleads with him and he says, listen. And notice, of course, what's he doing? He's showing that Eliyahu commands his authority, that he values Eliyahu's power more than the king's power. And he doesn't say, I'm speaking in the name of the king. He turns around to Eliyahu and says, please have mercy on my soul and my 50 men. I know you're more powerful. I don't care what the king asked me to do. I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I respect you and honor you, but I've got to listen to the king. Have honor for me. And that's when the, 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 the Malach, notice again, Eliyahu doesn't change his course until an angel of God speaks to Eliyahu himself. Once again, the notion of Malachim. Malachim in this chapter are both divine angels and this worldly angels and says, don't be afraid. And of course, this allows me to ask the question, what was Eliyahu afraid of? And take a look at the Abarbanel at the bottom of the page where the Abarbanel says, um, here we go, take a look at the end. I'm highlighting it as we speak. Okay, sorry, that just backfired. Here we go. He says, says the Abarbanel, Ain Safek, there is no doubt that Achaziah Ratsa Lahorgo. No doubt Eliyahu thought that Achaziah wanted to execute him. And so he avenged his own life and killed the military force so that Achaziah would fear him and not attack him. Um, the question, of course, here is why is Eliyahu just killing 50 people this way, that way? What's he up to? And the answer seems to be this. Um, number one, <laughs> Eliyahu is Ahaziah's nemesis, just like he was Ahaz's nemesis before him, and therefore maybe he wanted to get rid of him. He's a nuisance, but possibly it's even deeper than that. Because if indeed Ahaziah is a um, idolatrous person, if he is a, uh, he thinks, and if he thinks that, so to speak, Eliyahu has condemned his death, then if you kill Eliyahu, what happens? then the spell, which was cast by the wizard, right, is broken, right? In other words, when you kill the witch, right, the frog turns into the prince, if you understand what I mean, right? Uh, the, the assumption in a pagan mindset is going to be that the, that the once you've got a Navi, right, the Navi, that the curse of the Navi can be diffused, if you can diffuse the Navi. And therefore, if I kill Eliyahu, my death sentence will be neutralized. And therefore it could well be that not only does the king want Eliyahu dead because he's annoying him and because he's uh, disrupting his authority and, and mocking his authority, I should say, but he actually thinks that by killing Eliyahu, Eliyahu, he will actually get a, a lease on life. He will actually be able to live. Whichever way, it's very, very clear that Eliyahu is doing exactly what Eliyahu did to his earlier emissaries, he is now doing to this lot of emissaries. Eliyahu is arm wrestling Echaziahu, and Echaziahu is clearly out of his league because not only is he going to use fire in order to subdue Achaziahu's military uh, delegates, but in fact, now those 50, those third group of 50, are not going to become his um, execution, executioners, they are in fact going to become his honor guard as they march with him into Shomron, right? And now Eliyahu gets to deliver the message in person. <laughs> and here we see this titanic struggle between Eliyahu and Ahav, and then now become Eliyahu and Ahaziahu. And it's almost Eliyahu by brute force, by brute force is turning all of these, I mean, what does the, what does any ruler have if it's not that he is, on the one hand, the commander in chief, and therefore he can command his military, and on the other hand, that he has political delegates, he has his ministers, and he has his, uh, you know, his, uh, like we have in the Megillah, right? The Ashtarpanim uh, who go out, Haratzim, Yatsut Chufim Bidvar HaMelech, right? What do you have if your courtiers cannot be loyal to you? And in this case, Eliyahu has commanded both the courtiers and the military, and they are all, so to speak, now 
talking in Eliyahu's name, which maybe I should rephrase, they're actually talking in God's name, right? And they're saying, Ko Amar Hashem, something that Achaziah does not want to hear. So I think these are really powerful uh, imageries. And this is just another classic instance, just like what we saw with Eliyahu in the rain, where Eliyahu uses brute force and power um, but also quite a lot of craftiness in order to, first of all, show God's power, but second of all, to turn the people around like he did on Mount Carmel. Here, once again, um, we have uh, him turning the, the men of Ahaziah around. But again, notice all the typical motifs of Eliyahu, the fire, the mountain, the, um, the threefold stories, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Okay, last thing for our last couple of minutes. I just want to say one word about uh, Eliyahu's clothing. <laughs> and it's fascinating that Eliyahu seems to have trademark garb. He seems to wear a, have long hair. He's an ish bal se'ar. And we don't quite know what the se'ar is. Some people think that his se'ar is actually his hair. And other people think that when they say bal se'ar, right, what they mean is, and that's this translation here, that he was wearing a, um, a cloak. We're going to see a lot of attention to Aderet Eliyahu, Eliyahu's uh, cloak, and that a cloak was made out of animal hair, and in which case that is what is going on here. It's not in, 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 in the book of Zechariah, we find a prophet with an Aderet Se'ar, with a hairy cloak, whichever way, there is, uh, Eliyahu clearly is, is known by his Ishbal Se'ar, the uh, Azor or Azor al Mutnav, that he wears a leather belt. And it's just fascinating that we can imagine um, Eliyahu having a sort of trademark appearance. Let me say that he is not the only prophet to have a trademark appearance. And let me just mention one other prophet in this regard. Um, and that is, the, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one other thing about the hair. Um, was Eliyahu, therefore, if he had a lot of hair, was he possibly a Nazir? Okay, was he a Nazir? And in fact, in the book of Amos, we actually find in the same Pasuk, Nazirim and Nevi'im. Um, could it be that sometimes the prophets were indeed a, a Nazir? It would certainly be suitable for the prophet to be a Nazir, a man of God. And if I take both of those together, let me go to another prophet entirely, and that is the prophet Samuel, Shmuel. First of all, the Mishnah already has a discussion about Shmuel. Was Shmuel a Nazir? Because it says, Umora lo ya'ale al rosho. And they have a discussion. What is the word mora? Does the word mora mean a razor will not touch his head? Or does it mean fear will never touch his head? Whichever way there is a discussion in Masechet Nazir about whether Shmuel was a Nazir, but if I mention trademark garb, there's something very lovely about Shmuel. When Shmuel is a little boy, and we all know that Shmuel was dedicated by his mother, Hannah, to go to the temple, it says that Shmuel's mother would make him clothes every time she came up to visit him. She'd come, yamim, yamima, it sounds like once a year or maybe more than once a year, and she would bring him up clothing each time. Um, the phrase here is... Oh, gosh. Oh, here it is. Um, it says here, uh, chapter, it's sh uh, Shmuel Aleph, Perak, Bet, Pasuk Yutet, or Me'il Katon Taselo Imo. And she made him a Me'il, the word Me'il, every single year. Um, and she'd bring it up each year when she came up to bring a sacrifice. So she made one which was, you know, 3T and then 40 and then f <laughs> age five, age six. Each time she made him ill. Why am I mentioning this? Because you all remember the story where the um, the witch, the balata of the um, necromancer woman, brings up Samuel from the dead for King Saul. And when she's bringing him up from the dead uh, in Shmuel Aleph, Perak Kavchet, she says, Ish zaken ole. I see an old man coming up from the dead. The who hotel me ill. And he's wearing a me'il. And then it says, Vayeda Shaul Kishmuel. <laughs> Shaul then knew that it was Samuel. How did you know it was Samuel? There are lots of old men. The answer is he's wearing a me'il. She described clearly his robe. And I always think it's so cute 
that maybe he wore the same style, I don't know, the same style woolly jumper that his mother made him when he was two and three and four and five, and he's still 70 years old and he's still wearing, this becomes his trademark, his, tra his trademark clothing, right? I don't maybe, know, like Maybe it's a superhuman are. garment and it changed size as he changed size. You could say that, but whichever way, uh, maybe it's like, you know, Charlie Chaplin's bowler hat or I don't know, uh, Churchill's, Churchill's cigar and his, you know, some people they have, a, you know, a trademark, uh, you know, uh, Fidel Castro's hat, Sharonsky's cap, I don't know, what do you say, whichever way, choose your hero or your villain, but uh, the, the notion that you have uh, various Nevi'im who seem to have a trademark garment is really uh, just fascinating. Uh, it's not only today in today's world that people seem to have trademark, trademark clothing, um, you know John Lennon's glasses and all. So, um, so there you there you have it. Um, so we will leave it there for today. And next time, uh, I don't want to give too much of a spoiler, but we'll be learning the chapter in which Eliyahu goes up in a chariot of fire heavenwards, and um, we'll see you all again. Bezrat Hashem, same time, same place next week. A happy Purim to you all. Happy Purim. And uh, enjoy. Don't get too drunk, as they say. Oh, yes. yes, yes. Thank you very much. Purim Purim Samea. Samea. Oh, much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.